Hello and welcome to the Total Entertainment Podcast with me, Paul Collis. And today we will be drinking plenty of red, red wine. It's UB40. Let's have a look at what we got, shall we? Right, so, in the uh, yard and on the road adjacent, we have a total of five trucks and three tour buses. And I'm in the arena and it is pretty much all set up. They're just fitting in the mojo right now as we speak which means they just got to tidy up the mixing point and put the barriers around that. Finish mopping the stage and um, winch the last couple of bars up. Looking at the stage, we have some long line arrays. So they're probably uh, two wide in one cabinet. And uh, we've got the stack left and right. There's quite a few in this stack actually. And then further back at 45 degrees outwards, either side of the stage, you've the smaller stacks, stage left and stage right, for at 45 degrees outwards for the surround sound effect. Pretty bog standard. In the pit area, which they're starting to uh, seal off now with the mojo, you have eight subs aligning in the front of the stage. The uh, outside two, either side, are uh, stacked too high. And then on the stage itself, you have 10 front fills facing directly outwards with the one in the corner on downstage left and downstage right facing 45 degrees outwards. So a nice range of uh, audio equipment down there. Lighting wise, you have a lot of ladder trusses going up and down the uh, stage. So, and when I mean up and down, they're in a grid. So they're going from upstage to downstage and I'm not sure if they're on Kinesis. The amount of ladders that they've got though, I would hopefully assume that they are on Kinesis. And if you don't know what the Kinesis system is, it's a load of uh, winches that operate really rapidly as opposed to standard chain heists which are slow and clunky. If they are on Kinesis, they'll be able to pitch at 45 degree angles or anything in between, even vertically down. So it all depends on how they have how they have it programmed, if it is in fact a Kinesis system. Even if it's not a Kinesis system and on the standard chain winches, they can slowly move up and down uh, at different angles to give more options. Either side of the stage you have a truss going along the outer edge in between the grid and the uh, stage left and stage right sound stacks and on those tr and on those trusses you have ladders going down with uh, lights at the top of each ladder and right at the very bottom of each ladder giving more options for side lighting at the moment I'm not sure what's happening upstage but I can see them hanging up a white drape possibly to project onto it from the rear or to shine lights up from the floor and down from the grid to give nice lighting effects either in front of the drape or behind the drape depending on what effects they're going with. At this point as time it's too early to tell. Stage left and stage right you have rear projection screens the projectors aren't rigged in position yet, but the screens are. They haven't been adjusted for height yet, as the stage right screen is not quite straight where stage left screen is. So I believe they're focusing stage left and then they move on to stage right. And we will, and I'll update you on that situation later on. So audience wise, it's a hybrid audience. So you've got a horseshoe of the uh, tiered seating lining the outside walls and then you have the whole floor in the middle standing. The mixer, the f only the front of it is gonna be mojoed and the rest is going to be double skin bike rack style uh, barriers just to keep people out. And when it's double skinned, you have to essentially cable tie the first layer to the second layer. And the reason for that is to give it more stability in case there is a crush going towards the mixer, it will not tip over. So now we've uh, had a quick look at what's going on so far. I'll give you a bit of background on UB40. We'll be back after this. So not only does Master X Media have a series of podcasts, but we also have a series of books. The first book is actually two books, it's volume one and volume two, of a tribute to working at sea. 
The Best Fiction is Based on Truth. This is a compilation of short stories, rants and poems loosely based on the author's experience at working on a cruise ship. Some of these stories are based on actual events but highly exaggerated, whilst other stories are pure fiction. The title of the book, A Tribute To, is fitting with the tone of the book because, like a tribute act, it is a blatant altered reality where you can enjoy it knowing it's not quite the truth. There are things of alcoholism which used to be highly prevalent within workers in the cruise industry, as well as stories with a sexual nature. So sit down, relax and enjoy the ride of A Tribute to Working at Sea Volumes 1 and 2. All of these books are available on Amazon and are available in paperback and on Kindle. And the links for all of these books are in the description below. And we're back. UB40 are an English reggae and pop band formed in December 1978 in Birmingham, England. The band had more than 50 singles in the UK singles chart and has also achieved considerable international success. They have been nominated for the Grammy Award for the Best Reggae Album four times and in 1984 were nominated for the Brit Award for Best British Group. UB40 have sold over 70 million records worldwide. The ethnic makeup of the band's original lineup was diverse with musicians of English, Welsh, Irish, Jamaican, Scottish and Yemeni parentage. Current members are Jimmy Brown, Robin Campbell, Earl Falconia, Norman Hassan and Matt Doyle. And the past members are Ali Campbell, Yomi Babiemi, Jimmy Lynn, Brian Travers, Mickey Virtue, Astro and Duncan Campbell. Their hit singles include the debut Food for Thought and two Billboard Hot 100 number ones with Red Red Wine and Can't Help Falling in Love. Both of those also top the UK singles chart as did the band's version of I Got You Babe. Their two most successful albums Labour of Love in 1983 and Promises and Lies in 1993 but reached number one in the UK's album charts. Newbie 40 and the English ska band Madness hold the record for most weeks spent by a group in the UK singles chart during the 1980s with 214 weeks each. The band's lineup was stable for nearly 29 years from March 1979 until January 2008 when frontman Ali Campbell left the band, followed shortly thereafter by keyboardist Mickey Virtue. Another member, Astro, remained with the band until November 2013 when he departed the original band to team up with Campbell and Virtue in a new version of UB40. In 2014, legal advice was sought by the original band, now consisting of remaining co-founder members, drummer Jimmy Brown, guitarist Robin Campbell, bassist Al Faconia, percussionist Norman Hassan, and saxophonist Brian Travers, along with new vocalist Duncan Campbell who took action against the group containing Campbell, Virtue and Astro over usage of the band name. Due to it being used by both parties, on the 5th of July 2021, it was announced that Matt Doyle, formerly of the reggae band Koyko, would become the band's new vocalist. Following Duncan Campbell's retirement due to ill health, Travis died of cancer on the 22nd of August in 2021, and Astro died on the 6th of November 2021 following a short illness. UB40 were influenced by the many blues parties they attended as teenagers in the multicultural Basil Heath area of Birmingham. Their love of ska, reggae and early lovers rock inspired such original tracks as King, Madame Medusa, Food for Thought, Signing Off and One in Ten. Their early musical style was unique with a heavy influence of analogue synthesizers, psychedelic rock guitar, saxophone and dub producer techniques. The Campbell brothers are the sons of the late folk musician Ian Campbell. Their father regularly took them to folk festivals and gigs and introduced them to music and to touring. It was at his father's folk club, Jagger Punch, that Ali Campbell made his singing debut with Dave Swalbrook's daughter, Sus, singing Why Does It Have To Be Me? UB40 are one of the most commercially successful reggae acts of all times in terms of record sales over 70 million chart positions and touring schedule. During their three decade long career they have been performing sellout shows worldwide and headlining the Reggae Sunsplash Music Festival in Jamaica as well as spreading reggae to Russia and South America. They have performed twice at the Night of the Proms in 2000 and 2006 
They have been nominated for the Grammy Awards for Best Reggae Album four times and in 1984 were nominated for the Brit Awards for Best British Group. In October 2011, UB40 were commemorated with a Heritage Award, a ceremonial plaque from the UK's PRS for Music. A plaque was placed at the Hare and Hounds pub in Birmingham, England, a location where they played their first gig. All three of their UK number one hits and four of their five US top ten hits were cover versions. UB40 collaborators include Pate Baston, Madness, Bitty McLean, Chrissy Hindi, Maxi Priest, Robert Palmer, Hunters, Japanese artist Rika Dozen, French artist Nutella, Sa- uh, Lady Shaw, Africa Bombata, 808 Statue. With 214 weeks spent in UK singles chart over the course of the 1980s, UB40 and Madness hold the record for most weeks spent by a group in the 1980s UK singles chart. Referencing the group's longevity, Ali Campbell has said that the group was fortunate but in choosing a relatively young genre as reggae hasn't outlived its own core like jazz has. So here's their discography. In 1980 he had Signing Off. In 1981 Present Arms. 1982 UB40. 1983 Labour of Love. 1984 Jeffrey Morgan. 1985 Bagradidum. 1986 Rat in the Kitchen. 1988 UB40, 1989 Labour of Love 2, 1993 Promises and Lies, 1997 Guns in the Ghetto, 1998 Labour of Love 3, 2000 Cover Up, 2003 Homegrown, 2005 Who Are You Fighting For, 2008 24 7, 2010 Labour of Love 4, 2013 Getting Over the Storm, 2019 Full of Many and 2021 bigger bag of deadium right now we've had a bit of um, background and when we come back we will go into the support act we'll be back after this the name's vert percival reginald vert and i run the pr vert detective agency the year is 2055 and the police have been defunded so if you need a police investigation the police will charge you a thousand big ones a day because of this, the government introduced the PI Act, where the private investigators can undercut the police so justice can become affordable. These are my case files. Percival Vert is no hero. He is a low-life scumbag and the full embodiment of how not to be a man. He cheats his way into getting work, he objectifies women, and is quite a disgusting human being, if you can even call him that. Gumshoe is intended to poke fun at everyone that takes life too seriously and directly towel whips the modern day Puritans in the balls because they've forgotten the fact that when something isn't funny in real life, it's probably hilarious in the land of fiction. Come and listen to Gumshoe every Wednesday. The links are in the description below. And we're back. So we're going to take a look at UB40's supporting artist, which is Reggae Roast. I haven't been able to find much on Reggae Roast, so but what I have found, I'll let go over right now. So Reggae Roast are one of the UK's leading reggae, dancehall and jungle sound system crews. Combining the label, events and sound system, they have forged a reputation as a leading light in the resource of the UK dub scene, spreading the conscious message in the music far and wide. Reggae Race signed to world famous Trojan Records to release their debut album Turn Up the Heat in 2020, receiving critical acclaim and reaching number one in iTunes in the iTunes reggae charts. The album is a melting pot of the UK reggae scene and beyond, and includes collaborations with the likes of General Levy, Mr. Williams, Horseman, Tipper Irie, and many more. Their second album is in the making, so stay tuned. Reggae Roast have seen strong radio support for their music, with their album receiving thousands of radio plays worldwide, as well as doing guest mixes for the likes of BBC Six Music, BBC One Extra, Capital Extra, and Worldwide FM, as well as appearing on, as special guests on Rodigan's show on BBC One Extra. The Reggae Roast events are considered to be one of the London's premier reggae sound system events. Over the years, Reggae Roast have hosted world-renowned artists including The Wailers, Lee Scratch Perry, Sly and Robbie, Collie Buds, Mad Professor, David Rodigan, Suggs from Madness, Channel One, Trojan Sound System, 
Gappy Ranks, Finley Quay, Abba Shanti, and Mongo's Hi-Fi, and many, many more. They're currently testing the sound system, but will continue anyways. The Reggae Roast events are powered by the formidable customs build sound system. The 52 kilowatt system, aka the Beast, brings sound system design into the 21st century, both aesthetically and sonically. The 3 meter long terror horns mean it can recreate frequencies as low as 20 hertz. Bloody hell, that's that's bad. <laughs> bad in a good way, I have to say. You're going to feel that resonance right in your chest cavity. And it's lower than any other sound system on the market. In 2019, Reggae Race teamed up with Raver Tots to create Reggae Tots, family events where kids and parents can go on the dance floor and party together with world-class DJs and amazing production. These inclusive events are not to be missed. Festival favourites Reggae Roasts have smashed up DJ sets and hosted stages at some of the world's biggest festivals including Glastonbury, Festival, Secret Garden Party, Outlook Festival, Boomtown Fair and countless more. Reggae Roasts have also run their own imprint Reggae Roast Records on their label they've built from a formidable catalogue of quality releases, collaborating with world famous and grassroots artists along the way providing a much needed platform for artists within the UK scene. Currently on tour with UB40 and with a slew of festival and club bookings over the summer, make sure you check out Reggae Roasts are coming to a venue near you. And you can check them out on Facebook by searching Reggae Roasts and you can also find them on Instagram. They have Mixcloud and they also have a Soundcloud and they're on Twitter. All you need to do is search on those platforms for Reggae Roast and you'll come up with all their information. Now we've had a little bit about Reggae Roast, we'll be back after this. A tribute to men that hate their jobs is a brutal but witty portrayal of working a job you hate. In this podcast there are themes explored in which happy workers simply wouldn't understand unless they listen to these cautionary tales from a man that lost his ideal job because of the global pandemic. Be warned that this podcast contains strong, offensive language that some listeners may not want to hear. In addition, this podcast is definitely not recommended for younger audiences. The links for this is in the description below. And we're back. So let's take a look at how Reggae Roast did. Well, Reggae Roast started promptly at bang on 1900 hours, that's 7 pm in real money, and they consisted of a DJ with two MCs. None of the songs they uh, pumped out were recognisable to me, but obviously, if you're a fan of Reggae, you'll uh, know a lot of the songs that they did pump out. But damn, I have to say, it totally reminded me of being out in the Caribbean all those years ago when I would spend uh, at least four months at a time being out in the Caribbean working on cruise ships. You know, all that reggae music just reminded me of good times. Reggae Rose started the set with a quick tribute to the Ukraine situation and all the stage lights were in the Ukrainian flag colours in the right proportions as well, so upstage being uh, yellow and uh, downstage being blue. And they only used a small amount of lights themselves actually, so you had one upstage bar. The bars upstage are uh, the bars that are uh, furthest to the back of the stage. So anything that's upstage is upstage. We'll go into a lot of this in the near future with terminologies and whatnot. And I've got a whole episode of that planned out with other terminologies, but let's get back to uh, Reggae Roast. Uh, <laughs> Then they had the uh, side lighting bars, so the movers stage left, stage right on the uh, trusses there. And they also had the uh, front of house bar, which is not LX1 because it wasn't, LX1 starts on the stage, whereas front of house is in front of the stage. So they had uh, the front of house bar, which was toggling the movers between going into the audience and giving them face light on the stage. So it had a nice little effect and nice, vibrant LED uh, movers which uh, just made everything all so much better. Now the sound on the uh, on the whole DJ set was constant throughout. You had 
so you you didn't have any distortions from the DJ overpowering the sound system and redlining everything and also you had the uh, sound engineer front of the house who whose job it is solely to stop that from happening and it came out very clear and crisp and the front of the house sound engineer he made a nice balance between the two MCs and the DJ it works really really well by the end of Reggae Row set the house was 78% full and they finished off with a remix of Is This Love which had which had everyone dancing and singing had their phones out lighting up the uh, arena and the audience loved them they absolutely loved them there's a massive loud round of there's a massive loud round of applause right at the very end it was great to see that very great to see that especially after a few shows being cancelled and this is the first proper show back in quite some time because of that because of the situation that we went over last week anyways um if you don't know who reggae roast are but you like reggae check them out they've got some great remixes uh, that they are playing today and really really good remixes so definitely check them out if uh, if you haven't heard them before if you're a reggae fan you'll definitely get some great benefit of new songs as well that's what i loved about being in the caribbean listening to uh, new reggae that you wouldn't normally get back home in the uk we'll be back after this 30 years since is a sci-fi story podcast which is full of dramatical moments and a bit of gratuitous violence the first series was originally done in first person so it, the character is just telling a monologue and then the second series and onwards became more third person so it was more of an in-depth story and uh, you have all the characters actually interacting with each other great set of sci-fi stories so 30 years after an alien invasion which uh, the humans lost and the first story arc is now over though we've got plenty more story arcs left to tell from the land of 30 years since so why not check it out the links are in the description below and we're back so UB40 set wow that was an amazing set I have to say really loved it it was really really enjoyable to watch and even listen to but we'll get into those details in a bit so it started off with frank who introduced the show as a celebration celebrating the band being back on tour as well as celebrating the audience for getting through the two years of coronavirus and also celebrating the life of astro who is very much missed uh, in all music communities as well astro was well loved uh, within the industry Throughout the show, there are many images appearing on the back screen. Now, the screen wasn't actually a screen, it was a cyclorama. I briefly touched upon this earlier on in the day when, uh, it, was get, when it was in the process being, of being rigged up. Now, there is a good thing about this screen, or the cyclorama, which is an old school uh, type of drape. So, it started off at an angle from stage left it angled in towards the uh, mid stage and then arced out on a sharp right hand corner from the trusses that, it's, that supported it. Now with these two different angles when the, uh, psych, when the cyclorama or psych for short was uh, tied on it gave a nice interesting curve and just like your curved TV if you have a curved TV or if you've seen a curved TV it aided with the uh, high def projection that come onto it which I'll go into it a little bit more in a moment but it had a nice high def feel to it especially with the uh, small images that they had put on there for, and, and then there was a whole section I'll say a whole section it was two songs dedicated to Astro where the band went off and cleared the stage for two video performances with top quality sound on the recording of Astro singing live from a few years ago from before he passed away. Now the curvature of the screen aided with the uh, 
4K high def uh, resolution of, of the uh, projection from front of house just gave it a nice 3D op optical illusion and it looked very crystal clear and sharp really really sharp so to make an effect like that that took some experimenting at some point in uh, the AV warehouse where they uh, came up with the idea and they would have had to uh, experiment with the angles to get this correct. One thing I didn't agree with in regards to the uh, video of Astro was not tightening down the image. So you had spill of the image hitting the uh, band risers and um, it just looked a little bit messy at the bottom. That's my personal opinion. Other people uh, might disagree with me even the production team for me I would have just had the image uh, shrunk down in proportion but then by doing that it will kind of squash it I suppose so it's the trade-offs that you have it will squash it and then you won't get the curve the uh, stage right part of the curve fully to to its maximum extremes or you have it hitting the riser and you get the maximum width and uh, the full effects of the uh, high def curve. So swings and roundabouts, it's decisions that you make. There's no right or wrong answer on how it's done, it's just how they chose to do it and I respect that, I really do. It's a bold move, to be fair. Now the lighting trusses, which made a massive grid above the stage, they didn't actually pitch up and down, they just left them static, which with the past 64s, they just made a very, very nice light curtain effect and uh, by doing that you've got the past 64s on uh, medium flood lenses so CP62s at a certain height which uh, gives a nice pool of light and if you have enough of them at certain intervals they look like a light curtain now these past 64s were never they were never on full pelt they're on like uh, between 50 and 75 percent so when you combine those uh, flashing in sequence and combine that with with the vibrant LEDs they just made lovely and beautiful patterns of uh, light which uh, just bled through so they were just about seen the light was there but with the smoke uh, the uh, 3dness of it just makes some made some beautiful artistic patterns worked really really well now if I design this rig in the same way that they did I perhaps might have pitched some of the uh, trusses to uh, build a uh, wall of light at some, at some point in the show an effect like that though you could probably only use once and because they're on slow winches you don't want to be uh, having them going up and down up and down rapidly well they can't go rapidly anyways but it would have such a nice effect especially with how they've got all those park hands on a wall it would have looked good, but then again, it was reggae, so there's not many uh, songs that you could uh, do a nice pattern more of light like that. Perhaps uh, on one of the faster bass-heavy bass uh, tracks, but you could only do that effect once, and because if you kept using it, then it's like, uh, yeah, the secret weapon is just uh, meh, because you've used it so many times, it loses its effectiveness. Anyways, I digress. The clarity of the sound throughout was absolutely amazing. The show was loud, but not overpoweringly loud. The bass bins had a great feel to it. And when I say feel, you could feel the bass. They went more with the sub harmonics as well as uh, the low level uh, bass that you'd normally get within reggae. So it was more of feeling the bass rather than hearing the bass. And it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It wasn't ear piercing, it wasn't shattering your eardrums, it was just nice and tidy. There's clarity between every instrument on the uh, stage as well as the uh, vocals. And they even had the band set up in an old school configuration. Now when I say old school configuration you have bang in the middle, centre stage, you have the drums. Then the first instrument stage left was the bass guitar. Stage right, the first instrument was the keys, which is a traditional setup because the keys would be uh, directing most of the band uh, with both with um, with his left hand because most keyboard players or piano players 
are mainly right-handed, so most of the work will be done with the right and they can direct the band with their left. Hence the position of the keys traditionally being right of the drums. And when I say right, I mean stage right, not house right. And we'll go into terminologies of this anyway, uh, in another time, as I said, because this episode needs to be done with terminology. So stage right, so you, when you're looking at a stage perspective, it is from looking out into the audience. So stage right is uh, audience's left. Okay, we'll uh, go on to that probably in more detail another time. So on the right of the pianist, or the keyboard player in this instance, was the brass, so the uh, saxophones, etc. They are right of the of the uh, pianist. Now, if you go back to stage left, on the left of the uh, bass guitar, you had two backing vocals, and then uh, downstage, in front of the uh, backing vocals, you had the uh, main guitar, you had lead guitar. Now, go back to stage right, in front of the uh, horn section, you had the percussion drums, so the bongos, uh, etc they are positioned directly in front of them. So a nice bit of depth and you could hear the 3D sound as in the positions of uh, where the band were, you could hear that within the music. It sounded great, it sounded within balance and it sounded in that kind of uh, ethos. It worked well, the sound engineer was spot on it and it was so clear and per it was so clear and perfect. It worked really, really well. Now the last two songs, Can't Help Falling In Love was uh, classic everyone pulled out their phones got the torches out taking photos but now the auditorium was a sea of mobile phone lights swaying and mobile phones become the new uh, zeppo lighters from back in the day where everyone used to get their lighters out and have the flame at a, get at a concert because that's what you had back then you didn't have mobile phones with uh, torches on back in the day and um you had all the lights uh, front of the house pointing into the audience doing the old traditional break up gobo white sweep across the audience so scanning the audience and going as far into the audience as possible and then doing the into the audience and sweep across nice classic movements there but pain in the ass for anyone who is uh, directly in front of the stage because you always get the white lights shining directly into your eyes which to be fair they were in what I call the kill zone so that's their problem it still looks amazing and that's the whole point of the yeah, light and sweep is to look amazing and not care about anyone within the kill zone because you can't please everybody and uh, if 10% of the audience didn't like that last movement, then so be it. 90% uh, of the audience thought, yeah, that's a nice effect for that beautiful, beautiful song. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please hit like, subscribe and share. And if you haven't already done so, why not check out more of our content from Master X Media by checking out our website, which is www.masterxmedia.info. And we will catch you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.